Welcome to Miss Hell, a place where we dive deep into the dark and twisted world of female true crime. Grab a cup of tea and prepare to be shocked and intrigued by these amazing cases. Around the early 17th century in the quiet hamlet of Aldern, nestled deep within the Scottish Highlands, there lived a woman whose name would echo through the annals of history, Isabel Gowdy. Her tale, shrouded in mystery and soaked in the supernatural, would leave an indelible mark on the world of witchcraft and dark magic. Little is known about her early life, but it is believed she grew up in a modest agrarian community, surrounded by the natural beauty of the Scottish countryside. Isabel married a man named John Gilbert, and the couple settled into a simple life in Aldern. Gody and her husband lived in the area around Loch Loy, about two miles north of Aldern. In the 17th century, the sea loch was larger than it is now and was surrounded by woodland, hills and sand dunes. Gody's husband was a farm labourer, hired by one of the tenants of the Laird of Park. In return for his labour, he would have been provided with a cottage and the use of a small parcel of land. Like most families of their time, they relied heavily on agriculture for their sustenance. Unable to read or write, Gaudi possessed a good imagination and the ability to express herself eloquently. Her daily life was spent on basic household chores and tasks such as milking, making bread, weaving yarn or weeding. Isabel's life seemed ordinary, but the tranquility of her existence would soon be disrupted by the growing fear of witchcraft sweeping across Europe. The 17th century was a time when superstitions and folk beliefs were deeply ingrained in the daily lives of people. Natural phenomena, diseases and other unexplained events were often attributed to supernatural causes. This belief in the occult made it easier for rumours and accusations of witchcraft to spread. The Protestant Reformation had led to religious conflicts, and the Catholic Church's influence was waning in many regions. Old Dern, like many other rural communities, was likely affected by economic challenges such as poor harvests, famines or economic downturns. During times of economic hardship, communities often looked for explanations, and some individuals turned to blaming supposed witches for their misfortunes. Isabel, along with several other women in the village, was accused of practicing dark magic. Under intense pressure and possibly torture, Isabel confessed to being a witch. Her confessions were shockingly detailed, describing her involvement in a coven, her interactions with the devil and her participation in supernatural activities. It is uncertain why she came forward. The historian John Callow, who authored her Oxford Dictionary of National Biography article, suggests it was because of her involvement in a conspiracy to torment the local minister, Harry Forbes, a zealous extremist who had a fear of witchcraft. Forbes was a witness at each of Gowdy's four interrogations, Isabel's detailed confessions led to her arrest and subsequent trial. Her confessions were unusually elaborate, capturing the attention of both the authorities and the public. While the exact number of confessions can vary in historical records, there are six main confessions that are often cited. Isabel claimed that she could transform herself into various animals, including a hare, a crow and a cat. This ability allowed her to move undetected and participate in forbidden activities. She confessed to attending gatherings known as sabbats, where witches and the devil would allegedly convene. These meetings were said to involve dark rituals, dancing and feasting. Her first confession described an encounter with the devil after she arranged to meet him in the kirk at Aldean at night. She allegedly renounced her baptism and the devil put his mark on her shoulder and then sucked blood from it. She confessed to having sexual intercourse with the devil, who she described as a very cold, large, black, rough man. He had forked and cloven feet that were sometimes covered with shoes or boots. Isabel claimed that she and her fellow witches would cast spells on animals, crops and even humans. These spells were believed to cause harm, illness or misfortune to the targets. She also confessed she had the ability to fly, often using a magical staff or broomstick, to travel to the sabbats and other gatherings. Flying was a common theme in witchcraft confessions during the witch trials. She explained that brooms were laid beside her husband in his bed so he would not notice she was absent. 
The coven ate and drank the best of food at houses they reached by flying through the air on magical horses and entering via the windows. Isabel stated that she had familiar spirits, supernatural entities in animal form, that aided her in her witchcraft endeavours. These spirits were believed to do the bidding of the witch and assist in performing magical acts. Isabel also confessed to having made a pact with the devil himself. According to her testimony, she willingly entered into an agreement with the devil, offering her soul in exchange for magical powers and protection. It's important to note that these confessions were made under duress, during a time when those accused of witchcraft were often subjected to torture or the threat of torture. On 10th April 1662, the Privy Council issued a proclamation prohibiting torture from being used as a means of securing confessions from witches unless it was specifically authorised by the Council. This led to a caution, frequently being appended to commissions. In Gaudi's case, the Council advised she should be found guilty only if the confessions had been volunteered without torture, that she was sane and without a wish to die. There is no record of Gaudi being executed, although this is not unusual, as in 90% of Scottish cases the outcome is unknown, due to the local records no longer existing. Over the centuries, Isabel Gaudi's story has been studied by historians, folklorists and those interested in the occult. Isabel's life and confessions continue to be a subject of fascination, embodying the fear and superstition of a bygone era. Locally, it has been suggested she may have suffered ergotism, which can produce hallucinations and other mental instability. She may have become unbalanced by the imprisonment and lengthy inquisitions. While kept in solitary confinement, she was probably prevented from sleeping and mistreated. Scholars such as Callow and Diane Perkis suggest Gaudi's narratives about sumptuous meals indicate a woman who was continually hungry. Other details may be evidence of a powerless woman, angry and sexually frustrated by the austerity imposed by the ministers. Church and court records show rape as a recurrent crime during civil unrest and in the mid-16th century. Gaudi described her first carnal experience with the devil as being in 1647 when soldiers may still have been in the area, and Wilby postulates the lurid sexual details may be Gaudi's fantasy response to the trauma of rape. Wilby characterises Gaudi as a survivor of conflicts like the Battle of Aldin, who experienced the wrath of zealous, bigoted ministers and local elite that were frightened of witches. She was a skilled storyteller who entertained relatives and friends with narratives of the supernatural. She suggests the tales recorded may have resulted from a talented orator responding to a rapt audience. Through the centuries, her narrative has transcended time, weaving its way into the fabric of folklore and historical discourse. As the moon casts its eerie glow over the land and shadows dance in the flickering candlelight, I bid you farewell from this Halloween night. Stay safe, keep the candles burning bright, and until we meet again under the moon's ghostly gaze, have a spectacular Halloween night. <laughs>